Hi. Uh, you know, after lunch is great. I'm sure everyone's just nicely slipping into their comas at this point after the sandwiches. Uh, so I, I'm Aaron Klink. I'm director of interconnection for Netflix. My teams handle North and South America and EMEA. A little update on Netflix. So we recently passed 100 million global subscribers. There's a lovely picture of our CEO eating at a Denny's in Hollywood where he celebrated the 1 million mark. It's awesome. So 100 million, we're real happy with that. Uh, in January 2017, we hit our peak uh, view hours, at least that we've released. Uh, so that was 250 million view hours in a single day. All of our content, this is 100% of the video delivered, and, and this has been in place uh, since really summer of 2014, is 100% delivered from our CDN. So the peak traffic is in dozens of terabits per second. You know, when you hear anything scale around the Netflix network, it's always peak delivered. Uh, that tends to be Sunday night for those that are interested. That's when people are watching the most. So driver of external interactions. Uh, as mentioned, this is a little higher level. I'm not getting into to DDoS mitigation and, and packets per second by any means. This is more how are we efficient as a network, which is sort of the definition of scale, right? So on a unit basis, and I, I'm not talking overall necessarily how we minimize CapEx and partner resources. It's on a unit delivered basis. How are we getting more efficient? And this isn't linear, right? This is how do we get 10x and 100x more efficient as we go along? So a couple drivers uh, looking to minimize hardware CapEx. I think that's probably obvious to anyone in here. Uh, use of partner resources. We really try to remove the burden as much as we can from our ISP partners who are delivering the traffic to the end users. Uh, minimize OpEx, including headcount. Minimize overall complexity because it, it's hard to scale something 10x more efficient the more complicated it becomes. So internal decisions and external decisions are really made with simplicity in mind, and we try to re remove complexity from wherever we can in the system. And then resiliency. A everybody wants 100% uptime. Nobody wants to hit play on a Netflix client and have it not play. Um, and, and just kind of to reiterate, we have we are looking at efficiency because we have financial planning and analysis teams who look at our efficiency. And this gets reported to the CEO level. And I mean, really, this gets looked at at least monthly, if not weekly, at the C-level at Netflix. So th this is not just something where we're off running around you know, doing things without a whole lot of people kind of looking and, and helping us internally. So, uh, you know, the, this is the Ted Steven quote that just keeps giving when you want to put a presentation together. Uh, the internet is not just one tube. We don't have one data center in Ashburn, Virginia that pushes out dozens of terabits per second. Uh, as we go along, you know, so I'm going to give a couple slides here of things that we don't view as efficient and that we actually sort of design around. So submarine cables are great. They're very colorful when you put them on maps. Uh, they connect very fun places that you have to fly far between, but they are not particularly great when you want to deliver content to end users. So it's not so much the latency that creates an issue for content delivery for us. Uh, understand for ad delivery, uh, there are other networks out there with different design goals. But for us, it's really kind of inefficient to deliver gigs and terabits over submarine cables. There are more than enough people out there happy to sell you or us submarine capacity, but we've designed this overall system to avoid submarine cables where possible. And, and really, we've designed this, oh, sorry, I have one caveat, because our infrastructure team would be like a little let down, we do have a very efficient backbone connecting our sites to deliver essentially seed traffic. So like one copy of traffic of, of each title has to get out to our global data centers in order to be delivered. Uh, but, so if anyone says, hey, I thought Aaron said we don't do submarine cables, we do a little bit on the back end for some telemetry and to seed content around the world. But we do not deliver any end user content over our, our cable system. I should also point out these are 10 gig links at most. It, this is not a multiple 100 gig backbone at this point. Some of these links are actually one gig uh, for sites that, that do not have particularly large content catalogs. So another area where we try to squeeze 
out. And again, this is, we're not trying to deliver every bit of content from Ashburn, Virginia. So we're also not trying to deliver Florida from California and Seattle from Texas. The, you see these great maps and you're like, oh, well, if I just have the right pop in Chicago, I could really deliver anywhere. And that works to a certain point, but it doesn't work at, at our scale. So our goal is to get the content as close to the users as possible. And you shouldn't stand this close to a TV, even though they're, they're not, you know, they're better TVs now. But uh, this is really our goal. How close can we get our content so that it doesn't have to be hauled over aggregation links or subsea cables or any of this fairly expensive transport infrastructure that, that us and our, our partners have to work with? So really, this is how we design with our ISP partners in mind. And to give you an idea of the scale of where we're at today, we work directly with on the order of 1,000 ISP partners. And this is some sort of potential uh, contractual relationship. This is someone that we have an SFI contract with that's peering, sorry, settlement-free interconnection for those who may not be following or if I'm using too many acronyms. Uh, we also embed caches, and, and we'll hit that in a little bit, where we offer for ISPs of a certain traffic level, and we're not the only ones in the room that, that do this, but we work in this from an efficiency standpoint. Uh, we provide free of charge hardware to ISPs of a certain traffic level so that they can really get that content into your neighborhood or at least into your, you know, your town, your metro region along those lines. So th this, is, this is to help kind of the whole system, and we talk about squeezing the traffic to the edge and getting it away from submarine cables and getting it away from even metro ag links if we can, uh, that kind of minimizes the overall cost structure of getting Netflix to our users, and it really maximizes the performance. We take as much congestion out of the, the entire delivery path as we possibly can. Uh, so th that's all based on content localization. It's all about pushing to the edge. It, I think some people have this idea that, oh, there's just this, inter the internet backbone is out there. And you can just throw some traffic on it and it gets where it's going. It, again, to some extent that's true, but when we're dealing at real scale, that doesn't exactly work out uh, in, in, in practice. Uh, so minimize use of ISP resources. ISPs do, you know, really do a good job of delivering all sorts of the internet to you, uh, but we try to make it as easy as possible for them to deliver Netflix traffic. Uh, we offer 24 by 7 by 365. Uh, you know, I think that's fairly standard, but to call that out, some ISPs are, are sort of contractually interested that someone will always be there to help them. Uh, we're always there to help them which is part of having a globally distributed team. So Netflix is at seven international offices right now. Uh, we don't have NetEng and Ops at all of them, but we're getting there. Uh, dedicated contacts. Again, if, if you're one of those roughly you know, thousand that work with us, uh, or, or even we're on the order of, say, six to 8,000 downstream ASNs that peer with us in one capacity or another, or, or are downstream from someone we peer with, we have contact resources for all of those people. So if you, here's an example. If you pick up a new net block and perhaps you bought it through a transfer from a different country, you may find that if you're an ISP, your users are suddenly geolocated to Brazil and that's a problem when you're in Croatia. So all, all of your customers all of a sudden from this block call you and say, hey, why are my consumers getting content in Portuguese uh, that can happen, right? So that, that net block is out there. It's been assigned to some Brazilian ISP. Now it's assigned to you. We work with a lot of people to resolve those issues as blocks get passed around. And sharing of best practices. So we do a fair amount of community support. We invest in a wide variety of events, both time and money. Uh, we're kind of broadly supportive of the internet interconnection community. And part of the goal of that is how do ISPs work best with, with everyone in this room with a wide variety of content and cloud services? So this is what our current rev of hardware looks like. Uh, it's this very nice Netflix red. Uh, the, there's a little extra glow from the, the pictures. But so this is a 2U box. Uh, our current internal goal, we, this is a storage box. Uh, I'm forgetting off the top of my head. So think about 200 terabytes of storage. 
Uh, we pair these up with 1U flash boxes with 100 gig interfaces, and basically we can deliver a terabit of traffic from about 19 rack units. So, so that's where we're at internally, and we're working with partners to get there as well. Uh, right now, we're, we're just a slight bit less efficient, but we'll have that fixed with Q3 for our ISP partners. So these are the same boxes we deploy at our data centers and that we ship to ISP partners. Th there's no difference in the hardware. Uh, we use exactly the same thing. It's pretty well tested. We do revs once or twice a year. This is where all these boxes live. So the, the, big, the, the slightly larger orange circles are where we operate data centers. We're at about 70 global data centers right now. And the green dots are ISP deployed local caching, uh, local caching servers. Uh, so I, I won't give you an exact number, but again, we work with on the order of 1,000 ISPs directly uh, on caching boxes. And when we, again, when we talk pushing to the edge, we have Greenland, we have Iceland, you notice some dots out in the middle of the Pacific. You may notice some dots in some places you haven't really thought of before, but a lot of people globally are watching Netflix. So I want to I wanna pick a couple examples of where scaling is working and, and this approach. And I do want to pick, unfortunately, on one technology that is not scaling particularly well. So, so to start with Brazil. Uh, Brazil's about 210 million people. There's five big ISPs. And then there are 4,500 registered ASNs in Brazil. We think, and, and this is our best estimate, we think there are about 2,400 independent ISPs in Brazil. These grow, and, and new ones pop up every day. This is like 20 years ago in the US. It's sort of the Wild West. Uh, I, I think a conservative estimate, let's say 70% of those have registered with the government as they're supposed to. Brazilian has it, an ISP registration thing. And let's say 30% maybe have lost that paperwork or it's, it's in the mail that we, they're working on it. But right, so, so you have all of these ISPs that, and I mean really like 2,000 plus ISPs that are working to distribute content in a really competitive and rapidly developing environment in Brazil. And, and you see, it's all over, you know, some of these dots, if you're looking at, if you're looking at Eastern Brazil, it's kind of dense along the, the coast, right? When you're looking at Western Brazil, that's all Amazon jungle. And it's pretty impressive that there's a competitive ISP scene going on in Brazil. Um, it, financing issues. This is sort of a non sequitur, but all of these Brazilian ISPs are paying something on the order of $25 to $30 a meg for transit. So that world still exists in certain places. It, it exists in certain places in Asia. It ex definitely exists in certain places in Latin. So th they have financing issues. And there's some real tricky stuff in Brazil with financing where home mortgages are running about 18% these days. So, so there is a market out there to fund ISPs in Brazil if you really want to go get into that. Uh, but as this, and, and we assume that market will get there. We assume that people will figure out how to get funded because they're scraping it together today. And, and when I say scraping it together, this is also back to the, I've got like 10 point to point links that I've bundled together to get a 100 meg circuit. It, there's some real creative stuff going on. I think that we'll get financing sorted out and then you will see this grow even more. Uh, also, customs expenses. So I don't know how many, raise your hand if you've tried to import network equipment into Brazil. Anyone? Okay, a, a few people. Um, you're looking at essentially 100% customs duty. So what you pay $20,000 for in California costs you $20,000 to get into Brazil. In addition to shipping, which can take, I, I, we'll get to logistics a little bit, but I've heard horror stories of people saying, well, I bought this switch and it's been over a year and my customs broker still hasn't gotten it through and I've paid them in advance. Uh, so Brazil is, Brazil is a really interesting environment to work in. Uh, interesting, yeah. So India, so, uh, you know, Brazil we've been working, Netflix has been working in uh, for at least four years at this point. We have employees in the market, uh, we have a kind of growing office in Sao Paulo. We've been there. India was launched when we opened up Rest of the World last January. We sort of look at India as, hey, this looks like Brazil looked maybe four or five years ago. 
You have real concentrated ISP and carrier control. You have six licenses for carry, uh, carrying traffic in and out of the country. Uh, there are exceptionally limited carrier neutral facilities. I, I know that that term came up earlier. We also essentially only deploy in carrier neutral facilities. Brazil has a real lack. And by real lack, I mean two or maybe three, depending on exactly how you count facilities. This is not San Jose, where you can go and find 30 different competitive neutral data centers. Uh, you have some regulatory challenges which is kind of an always evolving, and this includes customs as well, not quite as bad as Brazil, but they do definitely have some standards and some interest in protecting that market. Uh, so you run into customs and you run into logistics and, and so on. Uh, they also have a continually evolving mobile infrastructure. So you have like Reliance Geo, who's, do, who's doing a pretty disruptive job in that market, pushing LTE at a, you know, quite frankly, kind of an insanely low price at this point, but it's, it's a very aggressive pricing strategy in that country on the mobile side right now. So, you know, India is a real interesting market to us. We see this developing, and we see shades of what's happening in Brazil, where people are having, ISPs have ads up on poles with phone numbers, and a guy will come and cobble some fiber off the pole into your apartment, and, and it's working, but again, it's growing, and it faces roughly the same challenges that, that we see in Brazil. So sort of scaling with uh, CGN. Uh, CGN is carrier grade NAT, and, and we'll get into this a little bit. So you have IPv4 address space exhaustion. There are some RIRs that still have some v4 space that, that they're able to dole out, but uh, you know, largely assigned at this time, the tr there is a, a real transfer market for people buying v v4 space out there, but we, f we believe that that's going to get more and more expensive over time. So IPv6 shows up, and I know Martin Levy is in the room and is, you know, if for those that haven't seen Martin talk on IPv6, I think there should be a substantial amount of it on the internet, otherwise he's here and, and can discuss. Reasonable technology solution, except there's a wide variety of consumer devices out there, and we're talking cable set-top boxes. We're talking some legacy, and I, I won't call them out, let's call them legacy gaming platforms that are still somewhat widely distributed out there. These, unfortunately, are not working with IPv6, and probably never will. If you have a 10-year-old set-top box platform as a cable provider, as a cable ISP, you are not going to go somehow retrofit that because the stack just doesn't support v6, and yet you have hundreds of thousands of these out in the field. This is the sort of issue that we deal with, and people have said, hey, we're looking to fix this with carrier-grade NAT, which is essentially We'll give these all internally, internal addresses, whether that's v4, well, it has to be v4 in these cases, and we'll just NAT them. And someone has sold us this platform that they say will work great, and it has a 10 gig port, and we really think this is going to go well for us. Then they realize how much traffic from Netflix and Google and Facebook, and, and not to leave everyone out, but the rest of the internet that they're trying to pull through these devices, and all of a sudden they say, this doesn't scale for me, and we say, yes, we understand. Uh, s s but they've already bought this, so they have a sunk cost, which in their minds sort of prevents this challenge. So this is one where scaling is not exactly working out in the ISP world. It's not particularly cost efficient. It's not cost efficient at all, really. And it's not performing well. And this is the next kind of gap that, that we see out there for large providers g somehow getting to new platforms that support v6. In case everybody thinks, oh, scaling is just going great all over the world with everything, there are little pockets that are not doing so perfect. So internal capabilities. When I talk about dealing with thousands and thousands and thousands of ISPs, we have some internal issues. So, so we talked a little bit about efforts. We could potentially uh, ship OCAs to, uh, OCAs are our, our embedded appliance, to 190 different countries. I don't have a count off the top of my head. I want to say we've shipped to maybe 60 today, 60 to 70, something in that ballpark. So we covered customs, but like every country is different for customs. And like right now with Argentina, we had a nice gap of about six months where Argentina with a new president had relaxed their, their import on servers, on network equipment, on a wide variety of uh, like 700 line items of various technology. About four months ago, they decided, hey, wait, we have an issue with power supplies. 
So now anyone who wants to import a server into Argentina has to have a certification for the exact model of power supply that that device will, will in, it contain. And if you update the model number, or if you update one piece of that, they have to go through the certification process again. So the ISPs in Argentina, and it takes about a month, they have to go for every new power supply and every new device that they import. They have to go get another certification certificate for that power supply. Multiply that by 190 countries, and you start to see that, uh, what issues you can have with customs. Certifications, the, the same thing. You're just looking at, they take certain countries, take certain components that maybe they want to make internally, and, uh, and just put up a wall in front of them. And that presents a little bit of a problem. Third-party logistic pro providers, everyone who had their hand up for Brazil earlier, I'm sure has tried multiple third parties trying to figure out who can get devices into the country. You know, third-party logistics is a lot of work, and you have to find someone you can trust going into certain countries. And there's, unfortunately, there's some trial and error there. Uh, internal alignment, so we have multiple teams. We have a network team, we have a logistics team, we have my team handling interconnection, we have finance. All of this has to sort of be orchestrated together to be really effective. And I, I, will, I will tell you, the answer is not more meetings. The, the answer is really sort of out of the Netflix culture of hire exceptional people and we'll work to figure out these problems together with, with some loose alignment. Occasional incidents. Uh, we had a pallet uh, a couple weeks ago, and by a couple weeks ago, I mean like two weeks ago, that someone just dropped at a, at a warehouse. And all of a sudden, you've got $800,000 worth of hardware that's kind of lying broken on the floor. So that's replacement hardware that has to go out that you, pro that you didn't account for, that we're just like, oh, those boxes will get there. This provider has been good. They don't drop things, and then they drop things. So you have to react, and you have to be able to, to get your vendors and your suppliers to work towards kind of quick replacement when you needed a, a box in a place. Legal efficiencies. So I want to talk a little bit about legal efficiencies. Uh, we love our legal team. I think this is the first place I've worked where I can say that. Our legal team is, is really good with drawing lines on here's what's risky and here's what's not. So over the years, we've got our contracts down to the absolute bare minimum. Most of our contracts are a page, page and a half. We, we don't sign them except where we need to. And what we really try to do is take out weeks of back and forth of redlining. If you're working with your legal team it's, and you come up with kind of frequent redline items, highly encourage you to just find a way to move past those with, with partners. Uh, you know, that has taken weeks and weeks out of multiple discussion cycles. And I, I don't know that everyone takes a look at that, but we are trying to remove friction to scale this wherever we can. Uh, again, if you're going back and forth for weeks on red lines with partner legal, that doesn't help your partners out at all. So we're, you know, we're working on exactly where we need to be, and that's about it. And again, internal alignment. So legal, finance, us, operations, it, it's important to have all these teams on the same page. And like we spend a lot of time with our legal teams and biz dev teams walking them through what we do out in the world from you know, dropping fiber jumpers down on a cable on the on the table and saying, look, this is what fiber is. Because your legal person has probably not seen a fiber jumper. They probably haven't seen a server. Well, they may have, but we walk them through the physical aspects of what are going on. We we can take them on data center tours. Like we do a lot of work to get people aligned internally on that. So value for Netflix users, you know, the, we're not just doing this because we think it's fun, although it is fun, uh, but there are direct consumer benefits out of this. So when you hit play on your Netflix client, you know, we're responsible for what happens on, on our CDN side. So first off, play delay reduction. Nobody likes hitting play and having it take seconds. In fact, nobody likes hitting play and having it take any time at all once you've decided what to watch. So we're cognizant of that, and as we push content to the edge, it gets quicker, right? I, I think most people notice this. If not, the next time you're traveling outside of the US, see if you notice a difference in your experience. We hope you don't, but you might notice a little bit delayed depending on where you are. Uh, and what I really mean by that is, if you're on some remote island, you may notice a difference. 
in most of the world, we, we really hope you don't notice a difference. Uh, fewer incidents of rebufferings. Nobody likes it when the little thing goes around and is not at 100%. We fully understand that. Again, we ought to work every day to minimize rebuffers. We know what that does to the experience. We know what that does just to overall people's perceptions, and we definitely don't want you to switch away once, once you've clicked play. Uh, we have, you know, behind the scenes, and I'm not going to get a whole lot into this, but we do adaptive streaming, right, which is we start sort of in the middle, and we go up if we can, and if we can't, we go down a little bit, and we're our, our algorithms teams are constantly kind of approaching that one way or the other and tuning for the best consumer experience. So what, what that means to us is we, we try to provide as clear a path to the ISP as we can so that those algorithms can have their maximum effect and people can get to the highest quality as quickly as they possibly can. And overall, this is higher level of consumer joy, right? Everyone wants to click Netflix and have a good time and not even think about what's going on behind the scenes, and that's really our job. Because if you have to think, geez, I've seen those guys present at all these conferences, but I have the little spinny thing and I'm rebuffering a lot, I should go harass them? Like, we don't want that. We, we want everyone just to click play and get the Netflix experience they, uh, they're looking for. And, and that's it. Uh, one, one quick thing. I know there's some Netflix people in the room. Um, could you stand up just if people have questions or want to hook up later? Yes, Callahan, you, you can stand up. <laughs> so we're in the room. And that's it. Happy to take some questions. We've got our mics all ready. Questions? We have uh, one up here. Hi, my name is Leo. Uh, question regarding IPv6 uh, CGNs and mobile. Yep. Have you noticed a considerable improvement uh, once being able to push via IPv6 to mobile? So IPv6, and first off, so we're 100% we're dual stacked everywhere. Uh, we are almost to the 12% of overall traffic delivered up over IPv6, uh, just to, to kind of set that background. I would say on mobile, it, it's really up to the mobile provider, right? There are certain mobile providers we've seen that are 100% IPv6 to us. There are certain mobile providers that are essentially zero percentage. Uh, I would say it's increasing, but it's not increasing at a particularly rapid clip. But there are mobile providers out there that just wholesale will are just going, OK, V6, I can't fight this anymore. I'm going to move forward. Uh, follow up. Uh, not sure. a question necessarily on uh, usage, but on quality. Yep. The rebuffering. Do you see? Do you notice less rebuffering? Uh, you know, I, I don't have that off the top of my head. Does any? Well, maybe we can find someone else from Netflix to, to comment. Thank you. Uh, the, to, to my knowledge, no performance difference uh, between the two, but it's a good question. It's Prashant. Um, how do you fail over a particular pop, the edge pop? If it fails, uh, how does that fail over to a, a different pop? What mechanism do you use sure. on the client side? Oh, good question. So uh, the, the steering is handled essentially by the client. So when you click play, the client will get a certain number of locations where it can get the title that you're watching from, and it will try those. and if the first one, if the network performance is good, it will stick with the first one. If it's, if it's not acceptable, it will uh, you know, fail to the second, and so on, uh, kind of with a fallback of, hey, I've done a couple, well, what are, I've done whatever number of tests. This was the best performing. I'll go with this. So, so all of that intelligence uh, kind of lives within a system that communicates with the client uh, to optimize uh, availability of, and essentially, if a pop goes down mid-play, it'll readjust, and it'll find the next best source. So what are the scenarios I can get buffering today, you know? Like, like what are the scenarios where I can get like a lot of buffering? Scenarios where you could get buffering. Uh, that's largely driven by network congestion. Okay. So, you know, if, you're, if your ISP is congested at some point along the way, that tends to be the main driver of rebuffering. Our pops 
and embedded pops, if they, if they have too many requests, or maybe not too many, once they are sufficiently full with requests and serving, new clients coming on to play content will fail over and will skip those, those busier sites. OK, thanks. thanks. I, sure, yeah, whatever you want to do. Oh, yeah. thank you. Sorry. Thank you, this is really inspiring. Oh, by the way, Kay from oh, DigitalOcean, and really love to see that I push everything on to the edge to have a better experience. And my question is regarding IPv6 and CGN. Mm -hmm. um, I might miss something, but uh, is that CGN is the solution, or CGN is not the solution? I, I, from, from our point of view, CGN is not a scalable solution. Great. And do you have any suggestions or you can share some insight into it instead of using CGN? Yeah, I, I mean, I think our suggestion is V6, right? And that's what we've pushed on, on ISPs for a long time, uh, which is find, essentially you know, work to find a way to make V6 work in your network uh, as opposed to, to deploying CGN, again, for the cost and performance reasons we've discussed. That's that's the push, and that's been our messaging for years. So, great. Uh, I was really happy to hear your focus on minimizing uh, play start delay and mm -hmm. rebuffering. I'm sure everybody in this room has heard about buffer bloat. Uh, does Netflix have any thoughts around uh, smart queuing algorithms like FQCoddl and Pi and explicit congestion notification to reduce those delays in the network? I am completely unqualified to answer that question. <laughs> uh, I, we, we can get you an answer. We have a couple NetEng guys here. We can get you an answer if, a little more developed than what I can provide. We should talk afterwards. Sure. Hi, uh, this is Thomas. Uh, how are you doing the seed video? Are you multicasting or? Uh, unicasting to all your site, uh, CDN sites? It, it's unicast, it's, it, to my knowledge, and someone can correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, unicast from site to site, so essentially one pop is pulling from its nearest pop, uh, and if it can't pull from its nearest pop, it's moving to the second one, but it's not designed, again, to my knowledge, to bounce to 30 different sites around the world to find content. How do you deal with uh, certificates and private keys for TLS? Do you also distribute them all around the world to all these pops, or do you keep them more centrally, and the user needs to do a round trip to this more central location? Again, off the top of my head, I am not the person to ask. Okay. We, can, uh, we can find a, Andrew's here. We can get you an answer. All right. Great. Thanks a bunch, cool. Aaron. Yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah, thanks. Thank you.